Hey everybody, welcome back. We are on PowerPoint Screencast 12 today. Uh, this is the knee and related structures. So hopefully by now you're getting into the groove of the course here and uh, starting to enjoy the fact that we're looking at specific body parts. Uh, so a lot of that foundational stuff that we looked at early in the course, we're starting to, uh, to be able to put it to use and, and look at ways that we can prevent and then subsequently evaluate, treat, and rehabilitate these specific injuries. So uh, certainly there's no shortage of knee injuries in, in our day-to-day. Uh, -day. So you, you, you can't turn on Sports Center without reading, without seeing an example of a high-profile athlete that sustained a knee injury. So uh, this photo may be a little dated, but RG3 was... Heisman Trophy winner, highly touted draft pick, and uh, his career, safe to say, has been cut short by the fact that he has sustained uh, a couple of knee injuries, and this one being uh, one of many. So we're going to take a look here at a number of these injuries, and just like before, we're going to always rule out immediate threats to life, so that primary survey comes first airway, breathing, circulation, level of consciousness, severe bleeding. Now it's going to be really rare that a knee injury involves an immediate threat to life, but the concern here is, is there a knee injury in addition to an immediate threat to life? We'll see this sometimes in the case of a car accident. You know, they slam into the dashboard, they've sustained a PCL injury, but they've got other issues that are more pressing. So. We don't want to treat the limb at the expense of the life, so that's where our primary and secondary surveys come in. Next, we move into our history, where we look at what was the mechanism. Did they land on a flex knee? Did they have contact? Was there a non-contact injury involved? And then we're also going to look for their chief complaint. Many times that's going to be pain or an inability to bear weight. Sometimes it's going to be a clicking or a catching or a popping. Then we get into the specifics of uh, their pain. What type of pain do they have? Where is it sharp or dull, localized or diffuse? Does it radiate? Does it stay put? Is it constant? Is it intermittent? Are there things we can do to, uh, to make it better or worse? From there we go to our observation. And this is where we're obviously looking at the patient. And this can occur before we get to you know, we, we don't necessarily have to completely finish the history in order to begin the observation. I'll begin the observation as soon as the patient walks in. So in the case of a knee injury, are they able to walk without a limp? Are there obvious signs of swelling or discoloration, deformity? Uh, notice I've also put pupillary size here. That's if we're doing a head-to-toe on-site assessment. Uh, by the time we get to the knee, the on-field assessment, we're not looking at their pupils. Okay. Uh, we'll also check respiration and pulse. How willing are they to move that leg? Uh, in the case of a fracture or a dislocation, oftentimes they won't want to move it at all. So that's, that's a pertinent, valuable piece of information. And then what's their leg position? Uh, if they're holding it in flexion, then oftentimes that will indicate a sprain because that actually offloads the uh, ligament structures in the knee. If it's locked out straight and they can't move it, many times that may be indicative of a fracture or a dislocation. And then we also want to look at their patella, and we'll take a look at the patella in a little bit more detail a little bit later in the lesson today. All right, our neurovascular exam consists of looking at pulses, looking at uh, sensations and motor function. Okay, so in the case of the knee, we're going to look at the distal lower extremity pulses, popliteal that we'll find behind the knee, uh, the posterior tibial that we'll be able to feel along the medial aspect of the shin, and then our uh, dorsalis pedis. And the best way to palpate dorsalis pedis, you may remember from last time, we stick our thumb right in that arch and then allow our fingertips to wrap over the foot. Uh, obvious signs of fracture or obvious signs that they've got some sort of nerve injury is that's a, that's a load and go. We don't mess around with those. Uh, we don't attempt to uh, manage that ourselves. We may splint it, we may immobilize it some way, shape, or form, but that's only in preparation for transport. 
Okay, when we're palpating the knee, uh, these structures are critical. These are kind of the windows. So I would encourage you to kind of poke around on your own knee as we talk through this. So what we see here, this is the patient's left knee. Uh, we see the patella, the tibial tuberosity down here. And if you feel that patellar tendon, it should be a rigid structure, uh, probably about the size of a finger and a half, maybe even two finger widths. Uh, connecting the tibial tuberosity to the patella. If you if you take your thumbs and put it right on that patellar tendon and roll your thumbs off, you'll feel kind of a, a fleshy spot on each side. That's actually your joint line. So uh, when we're palpating, we want to palpate that joint line both medially and laterally. On the lateral aspect, if we keep rolling out of that joint line, we're eventually going to encounter the fibular head, kind of a bony nodule there. Uh, on the medial aspect, we don't feel that. Basically, uh, we just feel the joint capsule. Okay, if they've got obvious provocable tenderness there in the joint line, then that, that may indicate a number of things. That could be meniscus, that could be uh, some sort of interarticular problem, say they've got a loose body, uh, could also indicate a cruciate injury. Okay, we're also going to assess the range of motion. What's their active flexion and extension look like? Uh, quickest way to check this grossly is roll them over on their belly. Have them flex their heel as close to their thigh or to their glute as possible. And use your hand to kind of gauge that. Can they get, can they compress your fist between their heel and their glute? Uh, compare that to the opposite side. For full extension, we roll them back over on their on the rear end and we look to see can they reach full extension. Okay, not a whole lot of special tests we're going to go over. Your textbook actually covers a lot more but for the sake of this course it's really not critical that you know them all. Uh, there's a pretty fair mix in the class of folks that are more interested in coaching versus those that are more interested in pursuing allied healthcare careers. So I thought it best to kind of split the difference. Some of the more specific tests uh, we won't go over. Uh, but just like we talked about with the ankle, there are, there are types of tests that we can do. There are tests that we can do that are pain provocation tests, and there are tests that we can do that are stability tests. Okay, so all of our ligamentous testing that we're going to do are stability tests. We'll be able to actually see if one side is looser than the other. Okay, if we're doing a sideline assessment, uh, first thing we want to know is what's the mechanism of injury. Have they had a knee injury before? Uh, what was the mechanism? If we saw it, great. If not, have them show us on the non-involved side if they can. Did they feel any collapse? Did they hear or feel anything? Could they move it or did it lock? Uh, did swelling occur? You know, if 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 we're not there to see that initially, then uh, they may be swollen and somewhat guarded by the time we get there. You'll see this oftentimes. You, know, you may be. I'll find myself covering uh, a number of athletic events, and by the time I'm summoned to where that injury occurred, maybe they've already started to swell up. All right, if we're dealing with a recurrent or chronic injury, then our history questions will actually vary just a little bit as opposed to an acute injury. Um, so first of all, we look at what was their major complaint? When did they first notice the condition? Does that swelling come and go? Is it recurrent? Does the knee lock or catch on occasion? Uh, is there severe pain? Does it grind or does it grate? Does it ever feel like it's giving way? Uh, lots of times patients will actually feel like their knee is collapsing and they'll be afraid that it's a stability issue when in fact it's a muscular issue. If you were to stand upright with no muscular activity at all, the first thing you do is collapse, right? Uh, same holds true uh, for a patient who's sustained uh, for whatever reason chronic knee pain, if that quadricep is inhibited, then it'll feel like that knee gives way. Okay. Lots of times we'll also notice issues if they are ascending or descending stairs, so that may be of note. And then what past treatment have they undergone and did it help? Okay, with our observations, uh, some things we're going to want to look at here. How do they walk? Do they walk without a limp? 
how do they look when they perform half squat how do they look when they go up or down stairs swelling or effusion uh, we're going to look at a way to differentiate this but basically just think of swelling as outside the joint capsule uh, usually will swell as a result of a contusion, a direct blow, whereas an effusion tells us that they're swelling inside the joint, and that's a sign that there is a more serious problem in play here, like a meniscus tear or a cruciate injury. Uh, ecchymosis or discoloration, we can see that. Uh, what's their leg alignment look like? Uh, we'll take a look at, at some of these in just a minute, but valgum knees or knock knees or varum or bow-leggedness. Uh, hyperextension and hyperflexion. Do they have excessive flexion and extension? What's the position of their patella? Alta high riding, baja low riding patella. Are their patellae rotated inward or outward? Uh, patellar malalignment can cause a whole bunch of different anterior knee pain problems. And then the shape, size, length of their tibia and uh, femurs are also important. One thing we can look at is what's referred to as tibial torsion. Now, torsion always refers to twist. If you remember way back when we talk about mechanisms of injury, a torsion injury is when one end is fixed and the other end is rotated in the opposite direction. Well, that's precisely what a tibial torsion is. Um, we may have that uh, proximal end of the tibia square in the knee joint, whereas the distal is rotated outward, and we can tell that by how that foot is positioned with their knee in a flexed position. Okay. Uh, anything uh, less than 15 degrees is an indicator of a tibial torsion. Femoral antiversion and retroversion, we'll talk more about this when we get to the hip, but basically it's kind of the same phenomena at the hip where the femur are positioned different relative to the pelvis. Okay. Uh, so we may see a difference from one side to the other. Uh, this is not necessarily something that is equal bilaterally in every patient. and in, in many cases it is a unilateral condition. So here we see some examples of these postural deviations. So valgum we see here, this kind of knock kneed appearance. Uh, varum we see, and you know, the bow leggedness and then recurvatum, where we actually extend beyond zero degrees of extension. So we're looking for abnormalities, but if you look at each of these, they're actually symmetrical, which is, you know, the, the postural malalignment is not ideal, but the fact that they are equal bilaterally is probably a little better. Is there obvious swelling? Is there obvious atrophy in the quadriceps? A little harder to see atrophy in the hamstrings, but uh, we could see calf swelling as well, or atrophy. Leg length discrepancy. Um, this may be anatomical, in which case one leg is actually physically longer than the other, or functional leg length discrepancy, where they're actually the same length, but due to posture it appears that one is longer than the other. Uh, the biggest concern is anatomical because we can't really change that. Uh, we can provide a heel lift, we can do some other modifications, but it kind of is what it is. Whereas functional differences, a lot of times we can use rehab to train those out. Uh, stretch the concave side, strengthen the convex side, and pull them back into a neutral alignment. Some things we want to look at here, the tibial plateaus, uh, this has been in the news recently, at least this semester. Um, if you're watching this in subsequent semesters, you probably heard about it in the past. J.J. Uh, Watt sustained a tibial plateau fracture. Um, that is sometimes what's at issue when the ACL remains intact, but it actually pulls off of its bony attachment point. Um, not sure at this point whether or not that's what happened with J.J. Watt, but that certainly can happen. Some other things we look at, uh, the femoral condyles, the adductor and Gertie's tubercle. Um, there are pictures of all of these in your textbook, so I would encourage you to, to look there and be familiar with the anatomy. Surface anatomy at the knee. Um, in our athletic training program here, we actually have students draw this out on one another so that uh, 
they can navigate their way around the knee joint a little bit easier. But our vasti group and our rectus femoris comprise the quad. Um, we've got our quadricep tendon and our patellar tendon. The tendon connects bone to bone. Um, that sartorius, uh, longest muscle in the body, it's going to insert medially. We've got what are referred to as the medial patellar plica. We'll talk about plica syndrome in a little bit, but a lot of times someone may be concerned that they've got a meniscus injury because it's clicking, it's catching, it's popping, uh, thinking that it's fibrocartilage when in fact it is the plica, which is a fold in the joint capsule. And then on the lateral aspect, we've got the IT band, which a lot of you that uh, train or ride bikes, may have had issues with IT band friction syndrome in the past. Some other things we look at, the medial and lateral collateral ligaments, so lateral and medial collateral ligaments, the pes anserine, that is uh, the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus. Um, those three muscles insert, kind of looks like a duck foot if, uh, if you ever get a chance to see a cadaver. Being dissected, you can see that pes anserine. It really does look like a duck foot, um, but over that medial aspect. Um, on the posterior aspect, we've got the hamstrings, the membranosus, the tendinosus, and the gastroc. And then over the posterior aspect of the knee itself, we've got the popliteus. Um, gastroc being distal, it's not part of the hamstring group, but the biceps femoris, the tendinosus and membranosus are the hamstring group. So I'm sure you've heard of the hamstrings. Uh, you should have had anatomy before you got into this class, so you should have learned uh, where the tendinosus, membranosus, and biceps femoris are, but it's worth reviewing the textbook. All right, so if we identify the fact that there is fluid accumulation in the knee. It's really important for us to differentiate. Is it swelling or is it effusion? If it's within the capsule, it's referred to as effusion. If it's outside the capsule, extracapsular, then it's just swelling or ecchymosis in some, uh, in some terms. Um, that swelling within the joint, that fluid accumulation within the joint, is caused by synovial fluid accumulation. If it's got blood in it, it's referred to as a heme arthrosis. Okay, break that word up. Hema refers to blood. Um, if you have a uh, hematocrit issue, then red blood cell count is is a problem. Uh, arthro always refers to joint. So heme arthrosis basically means blood within the joint. Uh, we can do what's called a sweep maneuver where we'll actually kind of wring the fluid out of one side of the joint capsule. We'll place our thumbs. So there's a link here. I'm not going to click it because anytime I have tried to do this in a screencast, uh, it has, uh, YouTube has flagged it saying it's a copyright violation. So uh, if I mouse over this, you can see there is a YouTube link there. You can just go to YouTube and type in sweep maneuver and you should be able to see it. Um, a blottable patella is another test we can do for this and basically what happens here is our knee joint is kind of the floor the patella rides on top and with a blottable patella test we're basically just pressing on that patella to see if we encounter the bony floor. If we do then that's a sign we don't have a fusion. If we don't and it feels boggy or, or uh, otherwise more fluid, then that would be considered a positive test. So extracapsular swelling tends to localize. It'll stay in one spot. Okay? It may eventually, due to gravity, migrate down the end of the calf and eventually even into the foot and ankle. Uh, when I had my stress fracture, my calf was actually swollen for a while. Uh, it was a proximal tibial stress fracture, but I ended up with calf swelling. So our special tests here for knee instability, um, we're going to utilize what's called the end point to determine stability. Uh, an MRI can be helpful for assessment with or without contrast. Uh, if 
if we're doing these stability tests, then we're looking for what's referred to as an elasticity, looseness within the knee joint. Uh, we're also looking for translation. If the tibia translates, then it is moving relative to those femoral condyles. And as damage to those stabilizing structures increases, both laxity and translation increase. We end up with a loose, sloppy knee joint. Okay, so varus and valgus. Um, this is not ideal positioning. He's basically doing this for the sake of the camera. Hand position's correct, but ordinarily I would teach my students we want to be nice and tight. So where that hand is stabilizing at the lateral aspect of the patient's left knee, I'm going to put that right up against my belly, and I'm going to stabilize their distal ankle right up against my uh, my left side. And I'm basically going to try to open that uh, gate, so to speak. So that's going to stress the medial collateral ligament. So this is a valgus stress test, tests the MCL. And then what I would typically do if I were actually doing this test is lift their leg up, sit inside, and actually sit on the table, hold their medial knee up against my left uh, belly, and the lateral aspect of their ankle up against my right belly and try to open with a varus force. So that is referred to as a varus test for LCL. Okay, these are both stability tests particularly the varus test is going to open a little bit normally. That's totally normal. Uh, the question is how does it open relative to the opposite side? Okay, The position of the knee is important for these tests, so I'll do this at full extension. I'll also do it at 30 degrees of flexion. If I get much deeper than 30 degrees, and you can try this on a partner or your roommate or somebody, if you flex more than 30 degrees and you try to apply that varus or valgus force, their hip will start to rotate in and out. So you end up, it feels like they've got a lot of laxity, but in fact you're not actually testing their knee, you're just moving them in internal and external rotation at their hip. Okay, same thing. Anterior drawer tests are a couple of cool ones on YouTube where the patient is actually under general anesthesia before surgery, and they'll have a ton of movement because uh, under general anesthesia, they're not going to be able to guard consciously or unconsciously. Okay, so with our anterior drawer test, we're going to position them in flexion, laying down, we're going to sit on their foot, we're going to palpate those joint line windows, palpate the hamstrings around back, uh, we want to make sure their hamstrings aren't firing because that's going to give us a false negative and we're trying to translate that knee forward anteriorly. So the reason why this test is really good for us is because we've got a lot of leverage here. The reason why it's actually kind of prone to error is because we've put their hamstrings in prime position to fight against this. So they may guard against this consciously or unconsciously and there's not really a whole lot we can do about that. So there are better tests for knee stability. Uh, that they're, they're harder to perform correctly. The hand positioning is a little less forgiving. But uh, So this test is pretty easy on hand positioning, but the downside of it is their hamstrings can fight against you. Okay, So our, our alternative here is the Lachman drawer test. If you've got large hands, this one is uh, pretty ideal because in extension, if the hamstrings fire, basically all they're going to do is compress that knee joint. They, they're not really in position to prevent that anterior translation, so they don't have the, the leverage to do that. The problem with this is we have to hold their thigh with one hand and their calf with another. Uh, 6-4. It's not a problem for me to be able to do that on most patients unless they're just you know, 350. Um, if you're 100 pounds, 5 foot 2, chances are your hands are not large enough to be able to do this with any amount of control. So uh, you may be kind of stuck with the anterior drawer test as opposed to the Lachman. Now, um, this is an example of a modified Lachman's where the patient's distal extremity is isolated between the legs, uh, but this is another test for ACL. So anterior drawer and Lachman are both ACL tests, and there's a YouTube link to this one too. You can just type in Lachman drawer test.
For the PCL, uh, we can use that same positioning for the anterior drawer, and instead of trying to pull forward, we actually push backward. Um, this one is fairly good. The problem with the drawer test uh, for the posterior is if they are already lax, they may sag into near end range already. So if you notice in this patient, you notice the contour of their knee, and we see how they have kind of this dip. Uh, that tells me that their, their tibia is actually already riding posteriorly. If I try to push that further, there's really nowhere else for it to go. So I may get a false negative because gravity has already pulled them into end range position. Now to kind of combat against that, I can use what's called Godfrey's test or the posterior sag sign where I elevate them into a 90 degree knee flexion, 90 degree hip flexion position. I can even put them up on a bench if need be and I look to see what's the contour of that knee look like. This actually doesn't look too bad. I'll compare this bilaterally. They may have some differences. But if I see this kind of dip or divot distal to the patella, then that's an example of a positive test. For the meniscus, I can't really do a stress test for this. I basically do a pain provocation or a symptom reproduction test. And this is probably one of the hardest tests for new clinicians to learn. It's called the McMurray's Meniscal Test. And with this test, I'm basically moving the knee throughout its range, flexion and extension. I'm loading it up in internal and external rotation, and I'm trying to see if I can reproduce a click, a catch, or a pop. Fibrocartilage is kind of notorious for being prone to clicking, catching, popping when it is torn. So um, what I will see here is internal rotation, deep flexion, move them passively out into extension so the patient should be totally relaxed. Another downside of this test is uh, it can be painful so they'll tend to guard against you. Uh, also repeat this test with the tibia externally rotated and move through flexion and extension. And I'm just looking to see do I cause pain, do I cause clicking, catching, popping. The plica, as we said, folds in the joint capsule. Notice they are right superficial to the medial meniscus. So they'll click and they'll pop. They're right in the joint line. So a lot of times this structure uh, may kind of masquerade as a meniscus tear when in fact it's not as serious. Okay, It's not really a structural pathology. Uh, so there's a couple of different tests we can do for this. Uh, the plical stutter, we basically have them extend the knee with light palpation, a couple of fingers over the patella, and we look to see if that patella tracks smoothly or whether it stutters, it kind of catches and grabs. With the Houston plica test, uh, we put them in supine with their knee flexed to 90, and then we internally rotate their tibia, passively extend their knee, and glide their patella immediately, looking to see if we can reproduce that pop. Apley's compression test, this is for meniscus. Um, kind of a useless test quite honestly it's in your textbook uh, we still use it but uh, the specificity is not very good on this test uh, if, if I have a patient with a meniscal injury more than likely I'm going to use the McMurray test I probably I don't see orthopedic surgeons really use this test at all they'll use the, the McMurray's test in exclusivity um, but basically we just try to compress the joint we're going to rotate tibia internally and externally to see if we're reproducing pain. It's not a stability test. It is a pain provocation test. And then the opposite, we basically take our knee, put it over their thigh, and we try to distract and internally and externally rotate. This may be indicative of a capsular injury. Some other things we can look at here, girth measurements. Here we're just looking to check bilaterally and then we're looking to trend their girth measurements over time. Um, take it at the joint line, the level of the tibial tubercle, uh, and then two centimeters above the superior border of the patella. And then some will also do a mid-thigh, eight to ten centimeters above the joint line. We'll also use a subjective rating on a scale of one to ten. What's your pain? Uh, ten being the worst pain you've ever felt, one being no pain, or zero being no pain.
All right, some other assessment strategies we might use involve a functional exam where we assessed walking, running, turning, cutting. This can be completely unorganized or just kind of spur of the moment where we have them jog back and forth on the sideline. Or this could be highly organized where we actually do something like a triple hop for distance where on one leg we have them hop as far as they can, we measure that, we compare it to the non-involved side. Um, some other things we might do are resistive strength tests where we assess the function of the muscles across the knee joint. Another thing we might want to assess is the athletes what's referred to as their Q angle. And the Q angle is determined by two different lines. First, a line from the ASIS, the anterior superior leg spine, um, usually round about the belt line. Uh, down to the patella, that's one of the legs of the angle, and then the second leg of the angle is from the tibial tuberosity to the patella. And the greater this angle, basically the more varus that patient has. So we tend to see a greater Q angle in females than males because their hips are relatively wider for giving birth. Uh, normal angle for males is around 10 degrees, for females is around 15. If we have a greater than normal Q angle, then the line of pull of the quadricep starts to become increasingly laterally directed. So the patella is less likely to move up and down, and it's more likely to glide out, which can cause knee pain. The A angle, on the other hand, we use the... Uh, line of the tibial tubercle to the patella again, but instead of going patella to the ASIS, we go inferior pole of the patella uh, to the tibial tubercle. Uh, and this is just a, an alternative that we can use. But more often than not, that Q angle is going to be used much more likely. We can palpate the patella all the way around. We can actually glide it quite a bit medially and actually palpate the undersurface of the patella. Uh, if we get grinding or compression or apprehension with movement, then that may be an indicator that the patella is at least somewhat involved in the pain that your patient's feeling. Now, preventing knee injuries uh, really does depend on a number of factors, posture, muscular uh, strength, uh, coordination, the motor patterning to keep the knee in a protected position is important. Lots of times we'll see non-contact knee injuries in patients that are underdeveloped musculoskeletally. Uh, or neuromuscularly more, more specifically. And what happens there is they tend to land with their knees in more extension rather than in flexion. And just like we talked about with the anterior drawer test, if I land in flexion, my hamstrings can actually fire to prevent the ACL from being loaded or, or from being loaded as much. Whereas if I land in extension, then I don't have that primary, that, that dynamic restraint of the hamstrings, and it's pretty much all up to the static restraints of my ligaments. Okay. Um, in an effort to prevent injury, extensibility of the hamstrings, the, I don't know why that says quad pollicips should be quadriceps, uh, and the gastroc is important. Um, so training the muscles of the joint to provide that dynamic restraint is really important. Okay. ACL prevention programs are really focused on enhancing that neuromuscular control. There have been a lot of theories as to why female athletes are more likely to sustain, on the order of two to one, uh, a non-contact knee injury than their male counterparts. And there are a lot of reasons that Q angle difference is one. The notch width of the distal femur is another. But for us as clinicians, not a whole lot I can do about those things. The only research that has shown any kind of alterable risk factor is the tendency for females to lack the neuromuscular control, the proprioceptive ability, the, the strength of their male counterparts. So there have been a number of studies that have actually looked at this, focused on improving this in female athletes, and have shown a significant decrease in the likelihood of injury after 
those athletes have done that type of training. Okay. Another thing we can do to prevent knee injuries is look at shoe type. So the length of the cleat is actually important, believe it or not. Shoes with shorter cleats don't allow the foot to become fixed in the turf. They're more likely to slip. Uh, and on the surface that sounds bad, but it's actually not. We're less likely to send forces up the lower extremity if our traction is not quite as good. The athlete is also more likely to, to keep their center of mass closer uh, to their base of support. They're less likely to get out of position if they know they can't trust the playing surface. If you've ever played on a wet or muddy field, you kind of know what I'm talking about there. Uh, so while the risks of slips may be greater, uh, the risk of significant knee injury is actually less with a shorter cleat. We can also utilize knee braces. There've there have been a number of studies looking at knee bracing and whether or not it's essential. We've talked about braces in this class before. Um, data is really lacking uh, to, to support the use of a knee brace to protect the ACL following surgery. One of the, one of the uh, recent changes in years, or one of the changes we've seen in recent years rather, is where quarterbacks have started wearing uh, a knee brace on the knee opposite their throwing arm. And the reason for that, if you think about a quarterback who's dropping back to pass, that lead leg, if I'm right-handed, my left knee is exposed to all of that, uh, you know, 300 plus pounds or 200 and however many pounds of defensive linemen that are headed my way. So that lead leg is far more exposed to potential trauma than the trail leg. Uh, so you'll see a lot of quarterbacks who have have started even using this preventatively. They, they haven't had a knee injury, but they're wearing a brace to protect their vulnerable knee uh, from that risk. Um, Something as simple as this is just an off-the-shelf strap-on collateral knee brace, important for a lot of offensive linemen. The, the likelihood of being struck from the outside of Algus Force, these are used to protect the MCL. Uh, these can be custom molded and designed to control rotational forces as well. So uh, if you watch high-level college football, NFL, you'll see a lot of the offensive linemen will wear prophylactic knee braces just everybody wears uh, left and right whether they've had an injury or not. So that leads us to injuries. Um, first is a tibial femoral dislocation. Now sometimes people will say oh I dislocated my knee. It's real critical to determine uh, are we talking about the knee joint itself or are we talking about the patella. Both are certainly serious injuries but a tibial femoral dislocation far more so uh, because there is a risk for amputation. There's a risk they will lose their limb. Depending on the study you look at, anywhere from 5 to as almost 60 percent uh, where the suggestion is if if a patient dislocates the true knee joint, the, the tibiofemoral joint, there's a risk of amputation. If there, and the reason for that is because we're disrupting blood flow to the distal extremity. These oftentimes will reduce on their own, but just because they reduce doesn't mean the vascular disruption is fixed. When it dislocated, it potentially damaged the nerve function to the distal foot, and it also disturbed the uh, blood flow to the distal foot. So as long as that vascular repair is made within the first eight hours of injury, the risk, according to uh, uh, studies looking at uh, basically uh, post hoc analyses, 10%. So, I mean, there's still a risk. Uh, if that vascular repair is made after eight hours, that risk jumps to 86%. More likely than not, that patient's going to lose that limb. Uh, perineal nerve injury we see in anywhere from 11 to 40% of cases. We actually had a case of this when I was uh, working at UTEP non-contact drill, our defensive back overstrided during a, a uh, simple pass protection, or I'm sorry, a, a, a defensive drill against receivers, and he overstrided, dislocated, it's like the first or second day of fall camp, um, 
he had to be airlifted back to El Paso. He had surgery right away. He had a he never lost, never had a compromise in the pulse, but he did lose neurologic function. So he ended up with a foot drop. He ended up with uh, some pretty significant atrophy. Uh, and after months and months of, of rehabilitation, he had surgery, obviously, but after months and months of rehabilitation, he was finally able to walk again without a brace. Uh, he never played again. Um, a third of these cases will recover completely. Um, another study indicated that uh, up to half would have a permanent complete deficit, which means the remaining uh, little portion there would have a, uh, a permanent uh, minimal deficit. So you see why this is such a big deal in the case of a posterior dislocation. We've got that popliteal artery, uh, our perineal nerve, we see the branch here, and when it moves out of position, we're actually stretching it beyond its normal uh, amount of movement. Now we know that the the nerves, arteries, and the veins do move somewhat, but they don't. They're usually tethered and, and held in position enough that a dislocation like this can disrupt their function significantly. Now, in the case of the football player I'm talking about, he had what's referred to as a taffy injury or a stretch injury to his perineal nerve. If you think about like a big stick of laffy taffy, it only works in the summer when it's warm. If it's cold, it doesn't work. But if you take that taffy and you pull it, uh, when it's warm, what happens? It thins out in the middle. It doesn't necessarily break unless you keep stretching it, but it will definitely thin out in the middle. And that's what happened to his perineal nerve. When it was stretched, it was traumatized, and it, it didn't rupture, but it did stretch, and it was injured. Now, MCL sprains are more likely than LCL sprains just simply because, kind of like we talked about with the quarterback, the lateral aspect of the knee is far more likely to sustain an impact. Okay? Uh, the, in order for a defender to deliver a varus force would mean they have to cut all the way across the body, miss this leg, and hit the, in, the outside leg. Okay, so medial collateral ligaments more likely. Uh, we grade these just like we do any sprain or strain, grade one through three. With a grade one, there's little to no macroscopic trauma. Uh, usually they'll be pretty stable on a valgus test. Little to no effusion and relatively normal range of motion. These just kind of hurt, but they're not terribly unstable. Um, crutches if necessary on these. Um, here you see that laterally developed, uh, delivered force, that valgus force, results in the tearing or injury of the medial collateral. Okay. Grade 1, usually they'll recover from this in a couple of weeks, three, three weeks at the most. With more severe MCL sprains, uh, this becomes a question of whether or not this is going to be handled surgically or not. Lots of times these will scar down appropriately and won't lead to long-term disability. With a grade 2, uh, they've got a partial tear, so what we see here would actually be indicative of a grade 2 sprain, not a grade 1. No gross instability, but some laxity as we uh, valgus test them. They may have some swelling, maybe even a, a light effusion. That MCL is actually a thickening of the joint capsule, so it, it can swell inside the joint or out. Um, they'll have pain along that medial joint line. Uh, we want to protect optimally load ice compression elevation for the first two or three days. Crutch use until that acute phase resolves. Um, they may do modalities for pain control. Uh, we'll start them out with just quad exercises. We know that a fusion of any sort will start to shut down the quads and that's the last thing we want. We want those dynamic stabilizers to remain online and ready to go. Then we progress them to closed kinetic chain exercises and functional activities. With a grade 3, this is a complete tear. Uh, minimum to moderate swelling. Just uh, You can't necessarily depend on swelling or effusion to tell you the grade of the sprain. Um, this is uh, really dependent on the athlete 
to determine how we're going to manage this. Even with uh, a grade 3 sprain, we may choose to handle this conservatively, just let it scar down. Uh, some of the exceptions to that, if they are a very elusive athlete, lots of lateral movement, then surgery may be the way to go. Um, we've seen this in running backs, wide receivers, uh, skill position players. They're likely surgical candidates. Baseball, volleyball, same thing. Uh, whereas if they're a, a cross-country runner, well, not so much cross-country, a distance runner, um, they might be able to get away with conservative management. Rehab's going to be similar to a grade 1 or grade 2. It's just going to take longer. Okay, with an LCL sprain, uh, we don't see these as often because varus force is harder to get in athletics. Uh, usually the tibia is going to be internally rotated. Uh, more often than not, this is going to be a non-contact varus force where they step awkwardly. That's why I kind of backpedal a little bit on cross country because of the rough terrain. Uh, they can encounter a varus or valgus load uh, fairly regularly. Uh, they're usually going to have pain and tenderness over the LCL, swelling and effusion, joint laxity with varus testing. Uh, they may also get some perineal nerve involvement that's going to impair their ability to actively dorsiflex. Uh, we're going to basically manage this much the same as the MCL, depending on the severity. Not, not a tremendous difference there. Where we do see a difference is with the cruciates. Okay, 75% of ACL injuries are non-contact. Um, so this is not often a result from a collision with an opponent, something like that. Females are at least twice as likely, and some studies would say as high as eight times more likely to sustain a non-contact ACL injury as their male counterparts. And we've already talked about some of the reasons for that. Um, there's lots of research that has been done here to look at why the difference between males and females, but as we said, it's that neuromuscular component that's trainable. That's really the only way I can intervene. I, frankly, I don't care what the intercondylar notch width or femoral notch width is in my patient. I can't change that. Um, I can't change the size of their ACL. I can't directly impact their Q angle to a tremendous degree but I can improve their biomechanics. Okay, So their conditioning, their motor skill, those kinds of things, that's what I'm after. So my injury prevention programming for this consists of a lot of jumps, consists of hops, um, single leg work, but with good form. Okay, So it's actually kind of rare that the ACL is going to occur in isolation. Usually if they've got an ACL, they've probably also got meniscus tear, potentially a joint capsule injury, and an MCL in many cases, kind of the unhappy triad. Lots of times they'll describe an immediate pop with severe pain and disability. Uh, they'll have swelling at the joint line and effusion that follows, a positive anterior drawer test, positive Lachman's test. Other ACL tests may also be positive. We didn't really go over any other than the anterior drawer than, or, and the Lachman's but there are others that you can see in your textbook. Uh, tore my ACL in high school. Uh, it was due to a hyperextension injury, non-contact, uh, and it, it really didn't hurt when it happened. I actually continued to play. Um, didn't really notice it till later that night when it started to stiffen up on me, and that's pretty typical. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. More often than not, this is going to be a surgery. The only time it wouldn't be a surgery is maybe if they're an older patient, sedentary. Uh, the problem with ACL injury is the rotary component. The rotary stability can lead to uh, chronic joint irritation, uh, arthritis. Uh, it's just not going to heal. It's not going to get better. Okay. Usually this is going to be, if they've done gone the surgical route, we're looking at six months, maybe seven in some cases. Uh, they may do this outpatient. Um, historically, they've done this inpatient, uh, but we've kind of gotten to a time where the likelihood of, of that has is, is actually gone down quite a bit. Uh, they may be in a brace or a long leg immobilizer, and uh, there are some options as far as where they're going to source the raw material, so to speak, for that graft. 
uh, bone tendon bone out of the patellar tendon, hamstring tendon, cadaver graft. There are a lot of different options here. PCL sprains, uh, we see this from a direct blow. You see an example here of a patient suffering a hyperextension trauma, but actually a lot of times it's not from a direct blow like this, it's from landing on a flexed knee and we get that same posteriorly directed force. Uh, one of the reasons this is referred to as a dashboard tear, we're sitting in a flexed position, come to a sudden stop due to an automobile accident, and that, post, that tibia is forced posteriorly, femurs still moving forward, and we end up with a PCL. Um, we feel a pop in the back of the knee, tenderness, and a little swelling. They may have some laxity, and they may have a sag sign. Okay. Um, these can actually be managed non-surgically as well. Uh, surgery will require up to six weeks of immobilization. Uh, but then we're looking at four to even six months of rehab after the fact. So here you see that mechanism, flexed knee. Uh, same holds true. It doesn't have to be the dashboard. I've seen this occur in basketball and volleyball players who uh, got crossed up or tangled up with, in the case of basketball, an opponent. In the case of volleyball, maybe they just tripped or stubbed their toe and they land forcefully on the hardwood with that flexed knee and suffered that, that same injury. Okay, with meniscal lesions, uh, this is fibrocartilage in the knee, shock absorbers of the knee. Uh, we can have an injury to them isolated, but lots of times we'll have other things going on. Um, if the patient's presentation doesn't really add up or make sense, think meniscus. This is actually what I thought I had when I had my stress fracture because I can tell you precisely where I was when I first noticed the pain and I have a history of meniscus tear. My ACL also resulted in a meniscus tear. So uh, I was thinking meniscus and usually it's really just a question of can you push through it. So if it's an overuse condition, I know, do less. Okay, If it's meniscus, it's do what you can do, and if it hurts too much, stop doing it. If if it doesn't hurt too much, keep going. So I actually kind of ran myself into a more severe uh, stress fracture because I misdiagnosed it as a meniscus. But usually the symptoms are going to be clicking and popping, which I had, uh, a fusion. You get a big fat swollen knee developing over a three to four day period. Usually pain with a deep squat. Um, so I had all these symptoms, okay? So it, it honestly, it didn't make sense that it was a stress reaction. So here we see the menisci can be injured in a couple of ways. Um, this is one of the reasons why you'll see people talk about, you know, a catcher has bad knees. It's because they're in this deep squat position for an extended period of time for years of their career. And this can result in a centra tear. Uh, whereas if it's a cutting mechanism, it's the condyles of the femur that are actually uh, kind of pinching the structure and tearing it. If the knee isn't locked but the indications of a tear are there, then we may need some further diagnostic testing. If, if they are locking, it may be necessary to do this under anesthesia. Uh, meniscectomies are actually pretty straightforward procedures. If, if we've got a meniscus tear, uh, basically the physician will just go in and try to clean out as little as possible. We don't want any clicking or catching, but we don't want to remove this. Now, decades ago, they would go in and just cut the whole thing out. Uh, my dad had this, had a motorcycle accident, and he had a complete meniscectomy. Solved the problem in the short term, but in the long term, guess what happened? Take the shock absorbers out, you get bone on bone wear over time. So he's now got a knee replacement. So they don't cut out the menisci in their entirety anymore. They cut out as little as possible to prevent the symptoms, but provide some relief. Okay. Now an alternative is a meniscus repair. Uh, that's a different surgery altogether. If I have a meniscectomy, I can be back in as little as two weeks. Uh, I've seen football players return to play seven days post-op, six days post-op actually in one case. Um, 
Whereas with the meniscus repair, we can't return to play nearly as quickly. So instead of cutting this thing out, they'll actually go in and suture it up and hope that it heals. Now some meniscus tears are more uh, responsive to a repair than others. It just really depends on how much vascularity there is, how much blood flow there is in that area. But that repaired meniscus may take upwards of three months. Okay, So the long-term outcome, no question, the repair is going to be better. Short-term, it may be the difference between a player returning to play that season and being done for the year. So lots of things to weigh. Uh, this was actually a criticism not long ago of Derek Rose. Uh, he injured his meniscus. He opted for the repair over the meniscectomy, and a lot of people question that. You know, hey, this guy's not tough. He's He's more concerned about his career than he is about helping his team. And I'm not saying whether that was right or wrong. I know in my career, uh, athletes have been pressured away by, by team physicians and coaches alike from the repair. But are they more likely to have problems down the road with the repair? No, they're, they're going to have a better outcome with the repair. It's just going to take them longer to get there. All right, with the plica, you can kind of think about these like pleats. Uh, we don't see pleated pants much anymore. Look at Google some pictures from the 80s of uh, dress pants, and you'll see plenty of pleated pants, pleated skirts. Um, you can think of these plica as pleats in the joint capsule. And what happens is those pleats actually kind of stick together, and, and we get localized inflammation. Um, generally, that's on the medial side. They've usually got a history of knee pain and injury. They've got some painful, I call it pseudo-locking because there's not actually anything in the joint. It's pain that, that is inhibiting motion. Um, so if you look at these signs and symptoms, they all look a lot like meniscus. The only difference is usually with meniscus we've got a mechanism. Okay, So if they've got no mechanism and these symptoms, uh, in particular if it's medial, then I can't necessarily rule plica out. Treatment for a plica is much different than meniscus, though. These can be injected with a corticosteroid. Um, we can treat this with anti-inflammatories, and usually these will resolve. If not, then surgery can be done relatively easily. All right, we're getting there. Uh, osteochondral knee fractures next up on the list. Uh, same mechanism as a collateral or cruciate ligament or meniscal injury twist or sudden cut or direct blow. Lots of times they'll describe a sensation of giving way, hearing a snap. Uh, this can only be confirmed through, uh, usually through an x-ray. Um, this, this injury will require surgery to replace that fragment to avoid joint degeneration and arthritis. Uh, related to that, a Osteochondritis desiccans is basically loose body. Um, this is fiber cartilage instead of hyaline cartilage. Um, here we get that articular cartilage and maybe a little chunk of subchondral bone that breaks free and makes its way into the joint space. Um, sometimes this can be due to trauma, but sometimes it just starts, okay, and we basically get this degenerative condition. Lots of times they'll have aching pain. There's that quadriplegia again. I think it should be. Uh, I, I did a find and replace for rice, and it changed a couple of rices and quadriceps. I apologize for that. Um, atrophy and point tenderness. Um, rest and immobilization for children. Lots of times, because they are skeletally immature, this will resolve on its own. Uh, in older patients, this this may be a surgical case. Okay, and. Related to that, any type of loose body, whether it's OCD or something else, um, this can be a result of fragments of the menisci, chunks of synovial tissue, part of the cruciate can be really any number of things. These can become lodged in the joint space, resulting in a lock or a pop. If these aren't surgically removed, they can lead to chronic degeneration. Joint contusions, relatively minor, so we're kind of making our way uh, away from the, the more surgical cases and into things that are more conservatively managed. 
Uh, here, usually we'll get a blow to the vastus medialis, uh, one of the quadriceps muscles. Uh, we may be concerned if this is a sprain, whether or not this is something more severe. They're usually going to have tenderness, swelling, discoloration. This may actually involve the capsule, depending on what struck the patient. Um, if swelling doesn't resolve within a week, uh, they may have a more severe condition. It may be a synovitis, the, the joint capsule itself is inflamed, or the bursitis may be inflamed, requiring more rest or an alteration of treatment. With perineal nerve contusion, this can be uh, a little unsettling for the patient because they start to lose muscular function, but the, the fact is this can oftentimes be a very temporary uh, set of symptoms and signs. Uh, local pain, they may have some shooting pain. Uh, added pressure may make this worse. So if they try to tighten their brace or uh, even tightening their shoes, usually it's not the shoes because it's going to be more at the knee joint. Uh, this will usually resolve pretty quickly. If it doesn't, it could result in foot drop because they're going to lose some of the ability of their tibialis anterior to function. Um, we may need to pad that fibular head for a few weeks just to protect them against re-injury. Bursitis, uh, we've talked about this elsewhere in the body uh, and we will definitely talk about it more as we make our way toward the shoulder for instance. Uh, here we get acute, chronic, or recurrent swelling. Uh, they can have a bursitis, this would be a pre bursitis, it's right in front of the knee. So even though their knee looks huge, it's not a fusion, it's not a joint capsule problem, it's, it's tissue anterior to the knee or, or superficial to the knee. Um, we have to figure out what caused this. Something like this was probably a traumatic pre bursitis. They landed on, on their knee or they took a direct blow to the knee and it swelled up like this. Um, if it's non-traumatic, then we got to figure out what's causing it. Okay. Uh, these can be aspirated and injected. Um, that'll calm them down and, and treat them uh, pretty readily. And then you notice the ACE bandage here. Once it's been drained and injected, we're going to wrap it to prevent it from swelling back up. Patellar fracture. Uh, these aren't terribly common, but they are debilitating. Uh, this can be the result of a direct blow. These can also be indirect, where a forceful quad contraction and a, a, a patella that maybe is a little uh, I want to say diseased, but is not completely healthy, has had some problems with anterior knee pain, it can actually pull it apart. Um, indirect fractures like that can cause the capsule to tear, they can cause separation of the bone fragments and quad tendon tearing. There's that police again, I apologize. Um, this may or may not result in a, ma here we see this massive defect. It may not be that severe. Um, we may want to splint this if the fracture is suspected. Um, we'll basically we'll treat it like a fracture until it, an x-ray tells us otherwise. Uh, this may need to be immobilized for upwards of three months. Okay, patellar dislocation. Here we see uh, you know that that laterally directed force from a high Q angle may result in a laterally deviated patella. A dislocation is usually going to result in a total loss of function. Patellar dislocation is not the same as a tibiofemoral dislocation. We already said the risk of uh, amputation can run as high as in the 80 percentile, 80 percent, if we don't get the vascular compromise dealt with soon. No risk of uh, amputation with a patellar dislocation, but it does result in a total loss of function. No question, it's terribly painful and it's going to take some time for them to recover. So once it's been reduced, they're going to be immobilized for about a month, be put on crutches, start with isometric exercises just to maintain the muscle. Uh, after that, we may uh, put them in a brace, some sort of pad that helps keep that patella in position. Um, we may need a surgery to release the tight uh, lateral structures, help them track more medially. 
and we want to do things to improve their posture and their biomechanics. Injury to the infrapatellar fat pad, this is kind of common, uh, can be wedged between the tibia and patella, direct blow can cause this, uh, can be uh, worsened with uh, chronic kneeling, pressure or trauma to the structure. Um, they're going to have pain, but it's going to be mostly superficial. It's going to be just below the patellar ligament. They may be weak, and that's because of the pain. They're getting some inhibition there. Uh, we want to figure out what's causing it, stop what's causing it, uh, use ice to minimize the inflammation. Uh, during extension, we may want to use a heel lift because full extension actually further compresses that infrapatellar fat pad, so we want to avoid that. Um, and then our knee hyperextension taping will keep them out of that extended position too until this can calm down. Chondro, chondromalacia patella. This is the cracking and popping you'll hear probably in your parents, uh, grandparents. The underside of the patella will start to soften and deteriorate over time. Uh, abnormal tracking will make this worse, but age causes it regardless of whether or not the tracking is good. I've had this since I was uh, in college and it definitely isn't getting any better. Um, another reason why the stress fracture diagnosis didn't make sense. Initially I thought it was probably my chondro flaring up. As it continued I thought it was uh, meniscus, but it turned out it was actually something quite different. Okay, With this, surgical possibilities usually uh, we'll try to manage this conservatively as long as we can with activity modification um, and usually we can keep it under control that way. Uh, if it gets too severe, it starts really cutting into training time, then a physician can go in and actually drill into the patella until it bleeds. Uh, there's some other things we can do for chondromalacia patella uh, surgically, but none of them are definitively better than the others. Okay, patellofemoral stress syndrome. This is kind of a loosely characterized uh, anterior knee pain. We'll get lateral deviation of the patella, tracking in that groove. We'll, we'll have some of the symptoms of chondro. We'll have some of the symptoms of even uh, maybe even plical syndrome, some, some medial pain. They'll have this kind of dull ache in the center of the knee. The more they compress the patella, the worse it hurts. So deep squats are uh, not something they really like. Uh, when we force that patella laterally, they don't like that either. Um, McConnell taping can be beneficial for this because it helps address that tracking. Um, if those conservative measures fail, they'll do what's called a lateral retinacular release, and this basically frees that patella so that it can track centrally instead of going out laterally. Just a couple other conditions here. Osgood Schlatter's is basically an irritation of the tibial tubercle. Sending Larson Johansson or Larson Johansson in your textbook. Uh, Disease is kind of the same thing, but instead of the tibial tubercle, it's the inferior pole of the patella. And what happens here is we end up with a traction apophysitis. In other words, the, the soft tissue is actually good. It's, it's maybe even, uh, you know, completely healthy, but it's being put under tension. We'll see this oftentimes in, in the case of a growth spurt where the long bones are essentially stretching the soft tissue structures because the rate of growth in the long bones is exceeding the rate of growth in the soft tissue. So we end up with traction across these structures. Now you usually won't see this concurrently. So this picture, uh, this guy's in, or this person is in really bad shape because they've got both going on. Usually it's going to be one or the other. Uh, this diagram is just showing you uh, where these two conditions manifest. Okay, so far more commonly you'll see Osgood Schlatter's disease. If you've had a big growth spurt, you've probably got a big prominent tibial tubercle. And what happened there is, and it's usually opposite your dominant hand. So I'm right-handed. I have a big prominent left tibial tubercle because that's the leg I tend to jump off of due to handedness patterns. If you're throwing, you're pushing off that left leg. Um, so due to, to your dominance patterns, one leg is probably more likely to have this than the other, but it can happen bilaterally. So we end up with tenderness, swelling, 
and degeneration at that attachment point. Um, your body will start to chase this injury with bone, and that's the reason you'll end up with that big bony tibial tubercle. Okay, something like this. Uh, because the soft tissue is kind of stretched taut, and now we've got a bony prominence, the uh, the patient isn't going to like to kneel. Uh, running and jumping are going to cause problems for different reasons, but they're still going to be problematic. Um, this will usually kind of come and go on its own if we can modify activity appropriately. Okay, a couple more slides and we're done. Patellar tendonitis, jumper's knee, or kicker's knee. Uh, you may have seen these straps before. Some people will use uh, uh, pre-wrap several laps and then they roll it up. Um, basically all that does is spread the tension across the structure to a greater extent than if they don't have it. Um, three phases of this tendonitis condition, pain after activity, pain during and after, and pain during and after, and possibly even constant. Um, if it's just during or after rather, um, usually we can modify that activity and it'll go away. But the problem with this is lots of times the athlete can't afford to stop doing it. They're a high jumper, they need to jump. They're a cyclist, they need to, uh, to put in reps. So uh, something like this is basically just symptomatic relief. It's not going to solve the problem, so we need to figure out what's causing it, address the mechanical issues if there are any. Okay, patellar tendon rupture. Here you see that patellar tendon has ruptured, so the patella, as a result, it's on tension. It migrates superiorly. We kind of talked about how that happens with Achilles tendon already, how it's on tension. If it's, if it's suddenly ruptured, then it's like a rubber band. If I stretched a rubber band and snapped it, its ends would recoil. That's essentially what's happening here. In the case of a patellar tendon rupture, they're going to have a palpable defect. They're not going to be able to forcefully extend the knee. Lots of pain, lots of swelling, not effusion, and initial pain. This this is a surgical case. Um, if we manage jumper's knee appropriately, we can minimize the chances of this occurring because the problem with tendonitis is improperly managed tendonitis turns into tendinosis, and tendinosis is degradation of tissue. So we end up with a diseased patellar tendon. It's way more likely to actually tear and rupture. Um, if they're using steroids of any sort, then intense knee should be avoided due to the weakening of collagen. And that doesn't just mean anabolic steroids. Maybe they've had a high-dose steroid due to uh, a, uh, a medical condition. Okay, In the case of MS, a lot of MS patients will take high-dose steroids. In the case of a patient that's had a, uh, a chronic inflammation, they might take a, something like a medrol dose pack, a, a high-dosage short-term steroid. Um, but during those times, we want to protect the, uh, the collagen by not loading it heavily. All right, last one, uh, runner's knee or cyclist's knee. Um, this could be at the IT band, it could be at the Pezan Serene, but basically that repetitive flexion and extension causes a friction problem as those structures cross over either the lateral uh, condyle in the case of IT band friction syndrome or the medial condyle in the case of Pezan Serene irritation. Uh, so the key here is to correct those malalignments. We can treat this symptomatically with ice before and after, proper warm-up and stretching, but the mobility is going to be the, the key here. So foam rolling, um, aggressive static stretching uh, can be a real uh, sal salvation here. We can also adjust the saddle height if they are truly a cyclist. Um, if it's a runner, we might want to look at their footwear. We might want to look at the surface that they're running on and see if we might be able to make things better there. All right, well that's it for knee. Um, next up we've got thigh, hip, groin, and pelvis. So we are making our way up the body, and so stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're getting close. I think we got a total of five more lessons, and we will be ready for the final. So hang in there. Dr. Brooks signing out.